So let's start. So the talk of uh, the first talk of this evening is about uh, cloud functions for Firebase, and uh, we are going to to, to do a deep dive. Uh, and the, the idea is to present the what, the when, the how, and the how not. Uh, ju just before starting, I will quickly introduce myself. So my name is Renaud Tarnek. I'm uh, living in Belgium. I'm a GDE for Firebase, and I'm a, a full stack web-based application developer, architect, and a project manager with more than 20 years of experience. Uh, exclusively in IT services company. Today and for for uh, eight years, I'm a I'm a freelance consultant. I have my own company, RTA Consulting, and my service offering is twofold. On one one side, I do some web application development exclusively uh, in Firebase uh, with single page applications, progressive web apps, and I also recently started with Flutter. And this activity is more towards uh, startups and uh, SMEs. And another activity is interim project management. I help uh, large companies in the management of uh, their uh, application development project. Okay, and this part is more with large organizations like uh, European institutions or uh, insurance companies and so on. So I'm, I'm very active in the Firebase developers community, in particular on Stack Overflow, where, where I answer uh, questions on a daily basis. And I'm also active on Medium, where I publish some uh, tips and tricks and some uh, some articles about Firebase. So let's start with the first uh, section of this talk. What? What are cloud functions for Firebase? So as uh, as PG uh, presented last week, uh, Firebase, uh, Firebase offers 18 different tools or services that help developers with web and uh, mobile app development, OK? And in the developer tools category, so which is named Build Better Apps, together with six other tools, we find cloud functions, which are a serverless, event-driven backend. And as you have already understood, this is the subject of uh, this talk. So an event-driven backend, cloud function for Firebase will let you automatically run backend code in response to events that are triggered by either Firebase services or by HTTP request or by Google Cloud Scheduler. We can divide the, the, the triggers in two categories. On one hand, one side, we have background triggers, which are mainly uh, triggered by Firebase services or Google Cloud Platform services, so we have triggers uh, from the, the two Firebase database, Cloud Firestore and Real-Time Database. We have uh, triggers from Cloud Storage, triggers from Firebase Authentication Service, tr triggers for, from Remote Config, Firebase Test Lab, Google Analytics, and Cloud PubSub, which is a, um, an, event, uh, an event bus, OK? And on the other hand, we have direct triggers. So instead of having a, a, a service that triggers the function in the background here, it's something that directly call, directly triggers the cloud function. We have HTTPS requests, so like a, an API that is exposed on the web, you can very well trigger a cloud function by calling a, a URL. We have callable cloud functions, where, which are similar to HTTPS requests, but are to be used within an application. And we, also, we can also trigger cloud functions on a scheduled uh, manner using Cloud PubSub a cloud pub subtopic and Google, Google, uh, sorry, Google Cloud Scheduler. Okay, so an event-driven backend, and at the same time, a serverless backend. So cloud cloud functions, which which are a product of Google, Google Cloud Functions is a serverless execution environment. So as any serverless environment, your code executes in a totally in a fully managed environment. You don't need to provision any infrastructure or worry about managing or configuring any server. The provisioning of resources happens automatically. So the platform will ramp up and ramp, ramp down depending on the, on, the, on the traffic, depending on the, the number of invocations. And the cloud function can scale from few invocations a day to many millions of invocations. Okay? And what's also very interesting is that you are only built for your function's execution time, OK? And if the function is idle, you don't pay anything. So here, the keyword is backend. Uh, if you, if you uh, remember the, the last presentation, the presentation of last week, uh, PG uh, mentioned the, the different client SDKs. So this is the model of, of uh, Firebase. Uh, it's a two-tier model, OK? 
it's not a three tiers model. We, I think you all know what is a three tier model with the client tier, uh, back end tier, and in the middle, an application server tier. This is not the case with Firebase. We have two tiers. On uh, the left side of the slide, we have the client application, and uh, it can be a web application, an Android, an iOS, a Flutter. And from the application, through the client SDKs, the application will write or read from or interact with the different Firebase services that are hosted in the back end. And most of the business logic is in the front end. So in, 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 in applications that are based on Firebase, there is uh, usually a lot of business logic in the client application. But with Cloud Function, we can also have business logic in the back end. And that's very interesting. And we will see uh, later on uh, why. OK, so Cloud Functions, a back end uh, service which gives you the opportunity to have business logic in two places in a in a Firebase uh, environment. So, what are the capabilities of Cloud Functions? So we are going to 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 go through all the different possibilities and capabilities through this uh, diagram. So on the left side of the of the diagram of the of the image of the chart, we uh, we have all the different uh, triggers. So like I said. You can trigger a cloud function by calling uh, an HTTP endpoint, so through an HTTPS request. You can call a cloud function through your uh, client application, uh, through a callable cloud function. You can trigger in the background, you can trigger a cloud function by all the Firebase services. You can trigger a cloud function by PubSub messages, or you can schedule a cloud function to be run at uh, regularly at certain uh, certain moment, exactly like a like a cron job, okay? And when the cloud function is triggered, what, what's happening? The cloud function can interact with the Firebase services, like writing to the database or reading a, a file in cloud storage or creating a new user in the authentication services, et cetera. The cloud function can also uh, call and interact with APIs and services exposed either in the Google Cloud platform, but also uh, on the web. Okay, so examples are, all the Google Cloud APIs, like, for example, uh, Google Translate or uh, uh, the, the Vision API, etc. Uh, cloud Function can also send PubSub messages. And the Cloud Function can call uh, microservices. And very common examples of microservices are, uh, for example, Stripe to make payments, SendGrid and MailGun to send emails. Okay? And last but not least, a cloud function can call any URL or REST API that is exposed on the web. Okay, so do that. This is a, the set of capabilities uh, a cloud function uh, offers. Let's go through through some examples of background triggers. Uh, we have, for example, background triggers for Cloud Firestore. So Cloud Firestore is uh, uh, one of the NoSQL database offered by Firebase. The information is, is organized by uh, in documents, and documents are organized in collections as well as in sub-collections. Okay? And you can uh, trigger a cloud function when a new document is created, when an existing document is updated, or when a document is deleted. And there is an on-write trigger, which actually uh, encompasses the three different, uh, the, the three different one uh, we see here. So with an on write, the uh, cloud function is triggered with creation, update, uh, or delete. For cloud storage, in any bucket in cloud storage, you can trigger a cloud function when a new object is created, when an object is deleted, or when uh, uh, an object in a in a bucket is uh, archived for buckets with versioning or when uh, an object uh, gets an, an update of uh, its metadata, okay? With authentication, the, the authentication service offered by Firebase, you can trigger a cloud function when a user is created or deleted. So these, these are examples of background triggers, and we will see concrete examples uh, later on during the talk. What's interesting to note is that depending on the, on the type of trigger, the cloud function will expose a number of properties of the entity Trigger the entities that trigger the function. For example, uh, if a document is created, the cloud function has access to all the fields of this document. Okay. If a user is created, the cloud function has access to uh, all the uh, properties of this user. 
And uh, in parallel, uh, we find we have a, a context parameter which provides some information about the, the execution of the function. For example, uh, the ID of the document that is created or the time um, the cloud function was triggered, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So that was uh, the what. So in a nutshell, what are cloud functions? Now let's look at when do we want to use uh, cloud functions? So I'm going to, to go through two slides that uh, are actually presenting a bullet list of, of use cases. And uh, I'm going to, to explain and to, to detail uh, each of the, these use, use cases. A first uh, very common uh, use of cloud function is to synchronize different database nodes or documents. So within, for example, within Firestore, you, you, you will use the cloud functions to update data uh, in specific nodes when uh, an update occurs in, a, in another node, okay? Uh, I'm sure you know that in the NoSQL world, uh, we do a lot of denormal denormalization, okay? And cloud function is a very good way to keep in sync documents that uh, are denormalized, okay? So if you have, for example, uh, a document uh, about a user uh, with a, a name and, and an address, and in another document, you have a review on a, a restaurant made by this user. If you change the name of the user on one side, you want it to be updated on the other side, and you can use the cloud function to do that. Another interesting uh, use of cloud function is to, uh, to do some counter calculations. Since, uh, the cloud function executes in the backend. The end users, the users from their app, cannot, uh, uh, how to say that, cannot uh, update certain parts of the database while a cloud function will be able to update this part. So for a counter, for example, if you want to count the number of wins in a game, uh, don't do that from your client application because the user could, could uh, just uh, do some uh, reverse engineering and uh, and uh, try to, to to fake the counter. Do it through a cloud function where you are in full control. Okay. Another use of cloud function is as a glue between several Firebase services. A standard example is, for example, when you create a user in the authentication service, you will create uh, in parallel a Firestore document which uh, holds uh, an extra set of data about this user. Okay, address. Uh, URL of, uh, of uh, the user picture, et cetera, et cetera. A third example of uh, when to use Cloud Function is when you want to, to, uh, to implement complex business logic that can only be implemented in a backend and not in clients because it's very complex or because it, uh, it needs to interact with some libraries that, that are only available uh, in, in, uh, in uh, certain languages, okay? So instead of implementing this business logic in the client, you implement it in a cloud function, and from the client, you call the cloud function in order to execute this business logic and to get back the result. Another uh, similar uh, use case is when you don't want to expose in your application your proprietary business logic. Uh, as you know, it's not very difficult to reverse engineer uh, an Android app or a web app, okay? So in some cases, you don't want to expose your business logic because it's your, it's your asset. And uh, what you can do is to implement this business logic in a cloud function, and users will not be able to, to see the code of this cloud function, okay? Another, uh, still in the same category of use case, it's to implement a business logic only once instead of implementing it for each client platform. So today with, with uh, platforms like Flutter, this is less, maybe a little bit less interesting, but it's still interesting if you if you want to, to have really native Android, iOS application, and maybe a web application that all do the same thing, instead of replicating the business logic in, in different languages for each platform, you will, uh, you will use a cloud function uh, in the backend and you will uh, develop only once, okay? You can use, or you will use also a cloud function. Give me a second, I will just close this one. Sorry, you will um, use a cloud function if you want to execute intensive tasks in the cloud instead of in your app, okay? So for example, a, a heavy calculation or something like that, you don't want the user to wait 
uh, in the application that this process is is, uh, is completed. So you can just call a cloud function, having the, the cloud with all the power of the of the Google Cloud Platform executing the, this complex uh, intensive uh, business logic and send back the result. You can also, through cloud functions, generate dynamic content that you will save through Firebase hosting. You can also send a notification through Firebase cloud messaging to, the, to your clients. Let's continue with examples. Uh, like I said before, uh, from a cloud function, you can call third party APIs or microservices. So if you want to execute a payment, if you want to call a Google Cloud API, if you want to send an email, use a cloud function. And what's also interesting is that through another cloud function, you can expose a webhook, so uh, also known as a reverse APIs, for the microservices to call you back to confirm uh, an event in the flow. For example, when you send emails uh, through Stripe, uh, Stripe can detect when a user opens an email, where when a user deletes it, when a user opens an attachment. And you may be interested by this uh, uh, information to do statistics, for example. So Stripe can call you back, and you will uh, use a cloud function, an HTTPS cloud function, to expose a webhook that the microservice will, uh, will call. OK, so this is quite uh, common with Stripe, but also with uh, GitHub, Slack, etc. Um, you can use Cloud Function as a workaround for some client SDKs limitations. Uh, the two main ones are, are uh, as of now, uh, listing sub-collection or listing collection. From the client SDKs, you cannot list all the collections of a file store uh, database, for example, while in a Cloud Function, because we use uh, another SDK, which is called the admin SDK, we have this possibility. We have also the possibility to use queries within a transaction, while uh, on a client, we cannot uh, lock documents, so we cannot use queries uh, from the client. Another very interesting example, and, and uh, somehow it, it is linked to, to, to the talk by Sylvia later, later today, uh, with the admin SDK, all the security rules are bypassed, totally bypassed, OK? So, um, Security rules are only uh, executed or only enforced from the client SDKs. So with a cloud function, you can do whatever you want in, uh, in the database, in cloud storage, etc. So it, it can be very interesting, for example, if you want uh, to, to fine tune the access or if you want to, to execute admin, uh, fun admin uh, actions, you do them through cloud functions because you are sure that uh, if you uh, on the other hand, set up some security rules that protect uh, the specific area you want to, to interact with. You know that you will be able to interact with this, uh, for example, a specific collection in, in Firestore. You will be able to interact it from a cloud function, while from the clients, it will not be possible because there are security rules uh, that prevent users to, 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 to interact with this uh, specific collection, to write and read this collection. Okay. Um, another classical use case is to manage Firebase users, to create, deactivate, delete, to uh, reset password, etc. And last but not least, uh, we use Cloud Function to set custom claims, which are the mechanism to implement role-based access rights. Okay, so those two slides uh, aimed at listing a set of use cases, but uh, we could have uh, three, four, five, six, seven slides. Okay, there are a lot of, of potential use cases for cloud functions. And at the end of the presentation, I, I uh, give some links to some uh, other sources uh, presenting uh, some, some, some additional use cases. Don't worry, the rest of the presentation will not be uh, bullet list uh, slides. We will really uh, interact and we will. Uh, we will have some examples and so on. Okay, so that was the when uh, section. So when examples of when we should or when we we, we have to uh, use cloud functions. So let's now go to the the, the big part of the talk. I, I will say it's the how. So how are we going to use uh, cloud functions? So first point: the development environment. So. Google Cloud Functions supports, uh, support, sorry, Node.js, Python, Go, and Java. However, 
if you use the Firebase CLI for deploying your cloud function, you can only target the Node.js runtime. Okay, so what we mean by cloud functions for Firebase, we mean cloud functions that are deployed via the Firebase CLI. Okay, if you want to, to develop cloud functions uh, in the other languages, Python, Go, and Java, you have to, to use other means, for example, the uh, uh, Google Cloud uh, console. Okay. But so the subject of today is cloud functions for Firebase. So it can only target the Node.js runtime. And so to start developing cloud function, you need a Node.js 10 or 12 environment. You need the Firebase CLI to deploy your cloud functions to the cloud functions runtime. You need a Firebase project. And you need to initialize the Firebase SDK for cloud functions. So. Uh, Sorry, to initialize the Firebase SDK for Cloud Function, you will create an empty project which contains all the dependency and some minimal sample code. And you will either choose TypeScript or JavaScript for composing, writing your functions. Okay, and obviously, therefore, you need an IDE for JavaScript or TypeScript. Okay, so now you are equipped to, to start developing uh, Cloud Functions. So let's look at the first steps. The first step is to import the required modules and initialize an app. So you are going to use Node.js required statements. And we will first uh, uh, import the cloud uh, function SDK model, module. Okay? And if you want to interact, if you want to access to Firebase services, to read, write in the database, to read cloud storage files, and so on, we need to use the admin SDK, as I have said before. Then you will require Firebase-admin, and you need to initialize an admin app instance, okay? And from this admin app instance, you can declare the different services. So database, you declare it through admin.filestore, storage, admin storage, authentication, admin authentication, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So let's write a, a very simple cloud function. It's, it's an HTTP endpoint. And uh, the code is here. I'm going to execute it. So it's very simple. Uh, with an HTTP endpoint, any request to the endpoint will result in two objects, request and, and response. OK, it's uh, the Node.js Express uh, framework. So we have a request and a response, which are passed to the on request callback. And what we, we are going to do here, we are just going to immediately send back a JSON to the caller, OK? So to, to the consumer of this HTTPS endpoint, we'll send back uh, a message, result, hello, South Africa. So you write this cloud function, and then you deploy it via the CLI with Firebase deploy, which will deploy all the services declared in your project, or Firebase deploy only functions if you just want to deploy uh, the functions. So let's have a look at how. Uh, we are going to, to execute uh, this, uh, this um, cloud function. So I will switch to a specific project, a project dedicated to this talk. And I'm in the uh, Firebase console. And I, uh, I'm looking at the functions, the cloud function uh, dashboard here. OK, you see that in this project, I have four cloud functions. They are all in uh, the US Central One uh, region. OK, and what the, the one I'm going to execute is this one which is an HTTP uh, cloud function. So I have it open here. So if now I just I use a browser, huh? if I just enter here, the cloud function starts, and I get hello, South Africa. OK, so that was an example of a very, very simple uh, cloud function. Let's continue. OK. We are now uh, reaching the most important part of uh, the talk. It's about correctly managing the life cycle of your cloud functions. OK, so managing the life cycle of your cloud function, and in particular, terminating them correctly is really, really key. Why? We will explain why in the, in the next uh, uh, three to four slides. But let's first try to explain what happens when a cloud function is triggered by an event. So, here, uh, we are in a, let's say, uh, so we are looking at one cloud function, which will uh, have several instances. So the slides show two instances 
of the same cloud function. So we have, we have the time here, OK, the timeline. So how does it work? We have the cloud function platform, which is waiting for, for events. We have a first event that is triggered. And so the cloud function platform receives the, the event and spin up, spins up a first instance. So it spins up the instance. The cloud function is executed, OK? It, it takes a, a certain duration. And then the platform is idle, is waiting. Then we get a second event for the same cloud function. Again, we are here focusing on, on only one cloud function, OK? A second event is arriving. This instance is not executing any cloud function, so it can uh, take this event in charge, and it starts uh, running the cloud function again, corresponding to this event, OK? So in one instance, events are treated one after the other in serial, OK? So one instance cannot uh, treat uh, events in parallel, OK? So that's very important. So for the third event that is coming, you see that it comes, and the platform sees that instance number one is still working on, on, a, on the execution of the previous uh, triggering. So what does the cloud function platform? The cloud function platform spins up a second instance in order to answer to this uh, event. Okay, So the second instance is triggered. The cloud function is executed. We get, at this moment, in the middle of the execution of this cloud function by uh, within instance number two, we get, again, an event. Instance number one is able to take it because the, the previous execution is finished. So instance one takes the, uh, the event and starts the cloud function. Now, it's very important to note that the cloud function platform, it's a serverless platform. So what, what uh, the serverless platform is going to ramp up and ramp down, OK? So it will start, it will spin up uh, instances on demand when, when necessary, but it will also constantly look if it, it can stop and kill some instances, OK? So ramping up and ramping down. So at this moment, and totally out of your control, uh, regularly, the cloud function will, will check if it can stop the instance, OK? So here, it check if it can stop the instance number one, but the cloud function platform sees that there is an execution running, so it doesn't uh, shut down this instance, OK? Later on, it, the cloud function platform check if it can shut down instance number two. Instance number two is idle. Nothing, nothing is happening because it has done its job with uh, the, this event, OK? So the cloud function platform clean up and, uh, and, uh, and uh, kill instance number two, OK? Later on, we have an, we have a, an extra uh, event. Instance number one is still available, so the cloud function uh, is started. During the execution, again, the cloud function platform tries to, to shut down this instance, but it's not possible because there is a, a run currently uh, being executed. And the next time the, the platform tries uh, to shut down instance number one, nothing is being executed, so no problem. The shutdown uh, can, uh, can happen successfully. OK, and what's the key point here is those two ones, the, the, those two uh, occurrence of, of uh, the check by the cloud function platform to clean up and uh, kill this instance while the cloud function is running. So obviously, the platform should not stop the instance at this moment because you are currently in the middle of a cloud function execution. OK, so we are going to, to, to see in the next slide how you can inform how you can uh, yeah, inform the cloud function platform that it's not the time to kill this instance. Okay. So why it is important to correctly manage the, the cloud function lifecycle? It's to make sure that the cloud functions instance running your function does not shut down before the cloud function successfully reaches its termi terminating condition or state. Okay. So most of the activities, most of the uh, uh, the work that you will do in a cloud function is asynchronous, OK? Writing to the database, calling, uh, calling an API on the web, et cetera, et cetera. And it's only when all this asynchronous work is completed that it is safe to terminate your cloud function, OK? So you should not let your cloud function terminate while the work is still going on, OK? As we 
just illustrated with the, with the previous diagram. And also, it's important to avoid excessive charges from functions that run too long, okay, or loop infinitely. So those are the two uh, main reasons why it's really important to manage the, the cloud function lifecycle. And uh, on Stack Overflow, I see a lot of, of questions where uh, the developer is totally puzzled because sometimes the cloud function works correctly and sometimes it doesn't work correctly. And there is no clear pattern, you know, and why is that happening? So the, the, the reason is that sometimes uh, the platform gives the time to the cloud function to execute before checking if it can be shut down. So in this case, yeah, the cloud function is executed. But in some other cases, the uh, platform kills the cloud function because the lifecycle is not correctly managed. Okay. So how to do that correctly? How to terminate a cloud function correctly? You have, we have two cases. For the HTTP triggered cloud functions, we have to send a response with uh, the re redirect send or end methods. For a background triggered and callable uh, cloud functions, we need to return a promise or null or an object. Okay, so uh, if I will be in front of you in a, in a room, I will ask uh, people to raise their hand, uh, the ones that, that, that know what, what is a, a promise in JavaScript. Uh, I cannot, so I will I will uh, spend uh, some some seconds to, to a bit of time to explain what is a, prom a promise. It's an object in JavaScript which represents the eventual completion or failure of an asynchronous operation, and it has three uh, three states. Okay, pending, so the the execution is is ongoing, fulfilled, it means success, or rejected, and. In cloud functions, we need to use a promise, a promise. We need to return to return a promise in background triggered cloud function, as explained here, uh, for those functions that call asynchronous methods in such a way that we tell to the cloud function platform to wait until the promise is resolved, meaning is either fulfilled or rejected. Okay, to wait this promise is resolved before cleaning up the function. So the, the Cloud Function platform, when checking if it can stop the instance, the Cloud Function instance, will, will look if there is a, a, a current an execution currently running. And if it sees that there is a promise that is not resolved, not fulfilled or rejected, the Cloud Function platform will not uh, kill the instance and will wait the uh, the cloud function uh, reach its terminating situation. Okay, so if you don't return a promise, the cloud function platform may terminate the function immediately, and again, you don't have any control on that. Okay, the only control you have you have is to correctly terminate your cloud function by either sending a response for HTTP ones or using promises for background triggered and callable ones. Okay, so let let's look at at uh, some examples, two concrete examples. So this is the, the cloud function we just executed before. Here, we are correctly uh, managing the life cycle because you see we are using the send method and we are calling the send method on the response object. So uh, no, no, problem to, no problem with this one. So this, this uh, cloud function is, is very polite, you know, it's, it's a hello, but to be honest, it's not very useful in a, in a, in a real application, okay? So like I said, in most of the times you will, uh, you will have some asynchronous job uh, within your cloud functions. So here is an example, quite simple, and we will see it uh, running later on. The idea here, so it's a background triggered cloud function because we trigger the cloud function uh, when a new document is created uh, in Firestore and a new document is cre created in the cities collection. So we have a collection where we have a list of cities and when a new, uh, document is created in this uh, in this collection what we want we want to make a log of the creation so we through the context object we get the id of the of the document that is created we get the timestamp uh, at which the event happened and we write in a collection called cities creation log we just add a new document with these two uh, two values okay so here what we are doing we are returning the promise, the promise returned by the add method. So the add method is a, is a file store uh, method, and this method returns a promise. So we are returning 
the promise returned by this add method, and then everything is fine in terms of uh, lifecycle management. But we were here looking at, at a, a case where we, we only call uh, we call only one uh, asynchronous method, but in many cases you will probably uh, have several asynchronous calls. Okay, so we have two cases: sequential calls, back-to-back -back calls. In this case, uh, we still have to use the fact that the asynchronous method from Firebase from the Firebase admin SDK return promise, and so what we have to do, we are going to use the async await uh, keywords. So we declare our cloud function async, okay, here, and we use the await keyword in the code to make JavaScript waits until each promise resolves and return its result, okay? Um, just for you to know, at the end of the presentation, and I will share the screen, I uh, explain how to, to do the same thing with uh, then which is a way to chain promise. It's somehow the, the, uh, the way we, we used to deal with promise before async await uh, was, was, uh, was available, okay? But with async await, it's, it's very interesting because you, you write uh, asynchronous code in a, in, a synchronous, in a synchronous way, you see? You don't have, you don't have to, to use callbacks, you don't have to use the, the then method, you just, uh, here with one line, I know that I'm waiting, that my code is waiting, that this asynchronous method uh, is completed, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, resolved, okay? So in, in a nutshell, I have an async uh, cloud function. I call a first asynchronous method. I await the execution of this method. I get a result. I use this result in another Firebase asynchronous method, okay? And I await the execution of, uh, of this uh, asynchronous call. And then I call a third Firebase asynchronous method and I return the promise, the promise returned by this method. Okay. Doing uh, like that is also okay if you want, for example, to log the fact that this function has correctly ended or to, to, to log a result and so on. Instead of returning, directly returning the, prom the promise, you can await the execution of the asynchronous method and later on return null. And you can do that because async functions always return uh, promise, a promise, a promise, okay? So here at the end, the async function will return a promise. So you can return null, you can return an object, you can return a string, whatever you want. At the end, since it's an async function, it will return a promise and uh, the platform will be happy and uh, will know if uh, it can or not uh, kill uh, this, uh, this instance. Let me look at the time. I don't want to, okay. Um, another case, it's to, um, so no, sorry, this one is an example and we are going to run it. So I said that we had two main cases. The first one is sequential calls, okay? And let's have a, a concrete example of a cloud function that uh, runs sequentially. So what are we going to do in this cloud function? We are going to uh, interact between cloud storage on one hand and cloud file store on the other hand. So the, it is a background trigger cloud function and uh, it will be triggered when a new object is created in cloud storage, okay? So what, what are we doing here? First of all, we are getting from uh, the, the object passed to the, to the callback function, we are getting the bucket, so the, the the place where the file was uploaded, we uh, we get the, the file name, and uh, we we declare a configuration to get a signed URL. So I, I'm sure uh, all of you know what is a signed URL. It's a temporary uh, URL that is used to open a file stored uh, in, a, in a in a storage service in, in the cloud. Okay. So here we this configuration for this signed URL uh, is that it can be used only for read and it has an expiration date, okay? So when we, we have this configuration, we can call an asynchronous uh, Firebase method, the cloud storage method, which is called get signed URL. We, passed, we pass the config to this method. And since it's an asynchronous one, we use the await keyword and we get an array with one element which contain the signed URL. So with this URL, so 
Again, we have uploaded an image to cloud storage, and now we, we have a signed URL for this image. And what we are going to do is to write this sign URL in a document in file store. So we uh, call admin file store collection. It's a collection with uh, that is named sign URLs. And in this collection, we add a document with two fields. The first one is a file name, and the second one is a sign URL. Okay, and we return again the promise returned by the add method. So let's give a try to this one. So I will. I will uh, head to uh, storage. So I'm still in the Firebase, in the Firebase console, in the in the cloud storage uh, part of the console, and here I will upload the file. So I will go here, and I will select an image. Okay, so the image is loaded. The cloud function, if we look at the at the uh, at the log of the cloud function, cloud function is uh, where it is, where it is, where it is. Up or down? No. Oh, it should have been executed. Yeah. So the cloud function is called generate fi file URL. So we can see in the log that it, it, uh, it executed. And if we look now in file store, so remember the idea is to write a URL to file store in such a way that we can open the image. So if I refresh because it's a new collection, I found uh, the collection sign URL, and in this collection I have a new document with uh, an automatic uh, uh, with the ID uh, automatically assigned, and I have the two fields that we, we, we saw in the cloud function. And I have a sign URL. So what I can do is to, to select this URL and to check that it's, it's the correct one. And indeed, it corresponds to the image that I have uploaded. OK, so here the cloud function kind of makes the glue between the two services. And somehow, we, you have the very first step of an image catalog. OK, so the user updates a, a file to uh, an image to cloud storage. And you write to Firestore, uh, the Firestore database, you write the, the URL of this image. So you are ready uh, with your app to, to, to query this collection and to, to display a list of, ima of available images. OK, so you saw the code was not very, uh, I mean, quite, uh, quite uh, simple. OK, we get the assigned URL and we write uh, to. Um, to to um, to file store okay and again what's important here it's the return keyword because we are correctly managing the life cycle we return a promise a promise second case it's when we have parallel calls okay so in terms in, in, in the case of parallel parallel calls we need to use promise dot all so what does promise all do it takes an array of promises as an input and it, re it returns a single promise that results to an array of the result of the input promises. Okay, so why do we have parallel calls? In, in the case where, where we have a variable number of uh, uh, asynchronous method execution to be done. So typically here, uh, I think you will understand uh, even better with, uh, with an example. And it, it, this is uh, the, the third uh, cloud functions that we are going to execute. Uh, it is called copy all countries. So what do I have? If I look at my file store instance, I have uh, a collection where I have a set of documents. I have 11 documents. And each document has two fields, a capital city, the, the name of the capital city, and the name of the country. Okay. And what we want to do with this cloud function, we want to loop over all of these documents. So here, we don't know upfront how many we have. So we cannot uh, treat these uh, documents in a sequen sequential way, in a back-to-back -back way, OK? So we have to treat them all in parallel. And what we want to, to, to do is to treat them in parallel. And when we are sure that all these, these parallel executions are done, uh, we can continue, OK? So how do we implement this, uh, this logic? First of all, 
we declare a query snapshot uh, on these uh, country collections. So we, we use a get method to get a, a snapshot of, uh, of, uh, of uh, documents, uh, sorry, uh, a query snapshot, which is a, a set of document snapshot. We declare uh, uh, an empty array and with the for each loop, so we are going to loop on our uh, query snapshot and for each document, we are uh, getting the data of the document, so the, the name of the capital city and the name of the country, and we push to this array, we push a promise, okay? So we push a call to the set method, which is again an asynchronous Firebase method, which return a promise. So what do we are doing here, we are pushing to the city's collection, a document which has the ID of the capital city, okay? And uh, which has two fields, the country, the name of the country, and a, a, a Boolean is capital city. So in our case, since we are having only capital cities, the value is always true here, okay? And so we build an array of, uh, an array of promises, an array of promise, okay? And we call promise.all, since it is an asynchronous uh, method, we use the await keyword and we get back an array of results. And with this array of results, since it's an own request, so it's an HTTPS cloud function, we are going to uh, send back a response to the consumer. And in this response, it's again uh, a JSON object where we say result equal the length of the array, CT documents created. Okay, so in other words, for each document we have here, a document, a city document will be created. And when it's it's done, we send back a message saying this number of documents, uh, the same number of documents uh, were, were created in the city collection. Okay, so let's try it. It's here. No, it's not this one. It's this one. So again, it's an HTTPS cloud function. So if I if I trigger it, so I get back a result that 11 city documents were created. And if I uh, give a look, and again, I have to refresh. I see my city's collection. And for each country, so I have 11 uh, documents. For each country, uh, I have a document with the ID corresponding to the name of the city and two fields, country and uh, is capital city equal true, OK? And you have maybe noted that uh, we have an extra collection that was created. It's our city's creation log. So you remember uh, previously I, I shown uh, uh, I show sorry uh, um, I shown uh, a cloud function that will implement a, a kind of log for uh, creation of city documents. So for each document that were that was created by the cloud function. Another cloud function was triggered and uh, uh, to create a corresponding log document with the ID of the document and the timestamp of, of creation. Okay. So you see here how the creation of some documents by one uh, cloud function has triggered another cloud function. Okay. We, and the two cloud functions are totally uh, separated from each other. Okay. So let's go back to the, to the slides. So what's important here, it's again that. We uh, here we are in an HTTPS cloud function. So to correctly terminate it, we have to send a response to the consumer. It's what we are doing here, okay? And we do that only when all the, the asynchronous work is done. And to do that, we use promise all because with promise all, we get a single promise that resolves when all the promise that were in the array are uh, fulfilled, so, okay? So we know that all the asynchronous work is done, so it's time to, to send back uh, the response. And then the, the Cloud Function platform will wait that we send back the response uh, before uh, cleaning up and killing the, the, uh, the corresponding response. It is exactly the same uh, uh, mechanism with uh, other uh, asynchronous method, okay? The examples I've shown so far were Firebase uh, uh, methods from Firestore or Cloud Storage, but if you want to 
interact from your cloud function with mailgun to send an email or with Stripe, you, you have to do exactly the same, OK? You have to wait that the update uh, uh, method from Stripe is fulfilled before returning null here, OK? And here, we ha you have to wait that the send mail uh, asynchronous method, again, uh, is fulfilled. The, the, prom the promise returned by this uh, uh, asynchronous method is fulfilled before returning null. That was a big piece of the of the of the presentation, but it's really really a key point. Okay, uh, take extra care to correctly manage the lifecycle of your cloud function because you 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 if you don't do that, you may end in in uh, erratic situations, like I said, and you will be like the developer. But what that's happening? It used to work, and all of a sudden, in some uh, 15, 13 percent of 30 percent of the cases, it doesn't work, and I don't understand why, and so on and so on. The the 99.99% .99 of the cases, it's because the developer doesn't correctly uh, return promise or uh, response. Okay. So how long do I have? It's six. I still have 20, 20 minutes, something like that. Huh? Can you can, can you confirm? Please. Ah uh, yes, you still have about twenty minutes. All right, all right. I, I will accelerate uh, because you will have the slides, and the, the rest of the presentation doesn't need to be to be as detailed as, as what I've done in the in the last uh, slides. Okay, so we are still in the. Remember, we are still in the how do we develop cloud functions. So you have the possibility to store and to retrieve environment variables for for your project through the cloud function built-in environment, the, the configuration system. So it's very it's particularly interesting when you want to keep your code portable. And uh, for example, when you uh, have different uh, environment, dev, test, prod, and you should, uh, using environment variables, you can just uh, deploy the same cloud function to the different environment uh, without having to change the, the, the values of, of some, uh, some uh, some variables, for example, uh, an, API, an API key, OK? So if you are using a, a different uh, instance of an API uh, in your dev and your test and your prod environment, uh, put the API key in an envir environment variable and just uh, read this variable uh, within your cloud function, OK? So to set and retrieve uh, environment configuration, uh, you have to use the, the CLI and to call these uh, these commands. Okay, so functions config set some service keys equal key some service ID equal ID etc. Uh, and you can also read the the current configuration uh, and it will have output some uh, some JSON. Okay, and to access uh, a specific environment configuration in your cloud function, you just uh, use functions dot config dot the name of your uh, of your environment variable. You can also configure the variables through the Google Cloud Platform console. Okay, don't don't forget that at the end, uh, a Firebase project is also a Google Cloud Platform project. So, for Firestore, for Cloud Functions, you can uh, very well use the, the Google Cloud uh, console to to monitor and to manage uh, the different uh, your different uh, pieces of code or the different services. Uh, Cloud Function offers a, a way to, to, to adapt uh, the, the different configuration and runtime options. Uh, the, the main ones are the region. So by default, when you write a Cloud Function, it's, it will be executed in the US Central One uh, Google Cloud location. But you can very well uh, declare another region here, for example, we want our cloud function to be executed in, in uh, the Europe West One location, OK? And you have the possibility of having the same cloud function deployed in multiple regions, OK? So you could, from your cli client, you could, uh, uh, if you're, you're, the user is in Asia, for example, you can detect that and you call uh, the cloud function that is hosted in Asia. You don't have to, to go to, to the United States to get back the results and uh, crossing uh, I mean, 
half of, uh, of the planet, okay? So you can, you can very, very well have the same cloud function deployed in multiple regions. We have also some, the possibility to adapt the runtime options, uh, mainly the timeout. So the maximum value is uh, nine minutes and also the memory. So if you know that your uh, cloud function is going to be a, a resource, uh, uh, will consume a lot of resource, a lot of memory, you can increase it up to two, two gigabytes. Okay, and again, you do that either through the GCP console or by calling the run with uh, method when you uh, write your cloud function. For monitoring and testing, I will go very, very fast. Uh, you have a, a set of tools to uh, write and view logs. Okay, so the standard console log, but you can also use Stack Driver. Uh, so there is a, a logging library for Node.js, and you can view the log like we did uh, in Firebase console. You can also uh, import the, the logs with uh, the Firebase uh, command line interface. You can use Stack Driver uh, UI, GCP console, and you can uh, emit error uh, to Stack Driver error reporting. And for testing, I know uh, Pagey has, uh, has presented the, the, the latest feature of the emulators last week. So you can very well uh, use the emulator to test uh, your cloud function because uh, the CLI includes an emulator which supports HTTPS functions, callable ones, and four types of background triggered functions, okay? And since the emulator suite includes multiple emulators, you can, uh, you can test cross product interactions, okay? So you can write into the Firestore, in the Firestore emulator and uh, trigger the cloud function in the cloud function emulator. And also, because I, could uh, speak uh, during <laughs> during hours. Uh, there are, here are some interesting uh, uh, points to be noted, and uh, I provide you links to to to, to get more information uh, about cold start because it has any uh, serverless environment. Uh, since the platform ramp up and ramp down, the first time the cloud uh, the cloud function platform has to spin up an instance, it may take several seconds, depending on the number of libraries, you, you uh, uh, number of libraries that are included in your code and so on and so on, okay? So here you have some tips and tricks to minimize this call start. And also, I know that Firebase is also uh, working uh, hard to, 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 to have a better, even a better solution and to, to somehow uh, uh, nearly uh, have no, no call start uh, time. But, news to come in, in, in the next month. Uh, how to manage uh, instance resources, how to retry asynchronous functions, how to use TypeScript, uh, difference between HTTP and callable cloud function. This is quite a standard error developers do because the, the, the protocol is quite different. So if you want to use callable cloud function, they are different than the HTTPS one, just uh, dive into the documentation uh, to understand the ins and out, okay? So let's rapidly, now look at the how not, what you should avoid, the kind of uh, anti-patterns or classical errors. Uh, the classical one is to return before work completion. So this is, let's take an example of uh, a cloud function that, that executes some heavy work, okay? So here we are not using the async await, but we are using the then, but uh, uh, it doesn't make any difference to, to, for the explanation. Here we have, a on request um, cloud function, so an HTTP uh, cloud function. And uh, what does the developer did here? He started by sending back a response to the consumer saying, oh, the heavy work has started. And then it starts doing the, the heavy asynchronous work. And when this asynchronous work is finished with the Zen method, he sends uh, again uh, a response saying, okay, the task is, the heavy work is finished. The problem here is that as soon as the developer sends, as soon as the cloud function uh, sends back a response, remember what's going to happen. It's a signal to the platform that, hey, you can clean me up and you can shut down the instance. So in, in uh, especially in some heavy and uh, uh, heavy work that takes a long time, the, the probability that the platform will kill the function is very, very high and the, the, the asynchronous work, the asynchronous heavy work will not be completed. So what you have to do in this situation is to use PubSub to send a message 
on, a, on, a, on the bus and to, through this message, to start another cloud function that will take in charge the heavy work. Okay, so what you do, uh, we uh, import the, the Google Cloud PubSub uh, library, and here we, through those lines, actually we build a message and we publish this uh, this uh, this message in a, in a specific topic, and then we know that we have delegate the heavy work to another cloud function, and then it's safe to send back uh, a response. And here we can say, okay, Mr. Custom, Mr. Consumer, the heavy work is acknowledged and uh, is going to start, okay? And then later on, if you want to acknowledge the user when the work is completed, there are a lot of possibilities. You can send a notification, you can send an email, you can write to a five-store document that you watch from your app and so on and so on, okay? So you delegate the work, and then it's safe to, want to, to, to send back the response. Another very, very famous uh, error is to forget to return a promise. Okay, we've spent, uh, I don't know, 20 minutes explaining that it's a must to return a promise, but sometimes uh, uh, developers forget it. Here is an example. Instead of returning the uh, promise returned by the add method, the developer awaits the execution, but doesn't do anything after, after that. So, we should either uh, return here instead of await, or we can keep await, but here we have to do return null, as, as we have seen in, in some previous slides, okay? Another classical error is to create an infinite loop. Uh, the classical uh, situation is where you, uh, you have a cloud function. So here we have a, a background trigger cloud function in Firestore, which is triggered when a document is updated. And the problem here is that we are updating the same document again and again and again. So we are updating the document, so the cloud function is triggered and again and again and again, and resulting in an infinite loop. So what you should do, you should uh, check what are the fields that, that were modified. And if, uh, for example, here we have a, a field status, uh, and we, we, do, we want to trigger the cloud function only if the status of the document has changed, okay? And only at this moment, we uh, can update the status, for example, to a value like modified, and the cloud function will trigger, but when it will reach this uh, this if, it will see that uh, the, 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 the um, value uh, is not different, and uh, it will stop. It will go here, and it will return null. I hope I was clear here, okay? So the idea is to, to avoid an infinite loop, just uh, test what has changed between two executions, and if nothing has changed, or if only what you want has changed, you execute or, or you don't. And if by mistake you, 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 you end with an infinite loop, the way to stop it is to delete the cloud function and uh, redeploy. And also, you should not use callbacks instead of promises. So we still find some uh, Node.js library uh, which don't return promise, but uh, return callbacks. So mm, if you are using such a library, you should promisify the callback, okay, by wrapping it into a new promise. Another common mistake is uh, to use a, a database listener, like on Snapshot in, in, uh, in Firestore, where the, the Typically, on snapshot is used from a client application where you are constantly listening to some uh, changes in Firestore, okay? But in a cloud function, it doesn't make sense to do that because a cloud function is something that has a short uh, execution time, okay? So you should, instead of setting a listener, you should read once what you want to read, what you want to get, and that's it. Uh, also, don't execute very long operations. Uh, like uh, like I said, the maximum uh, duration for a cloud function is nine minutes. So if you have some some code that needs a longer time to execute, you should choose another approach, another uh, service like App Engine or, or etc. Okay. Uh, another classical error is when you work with with uh, with files, for example, to to uh, uh, analyze images or to create thumbnails and stuff like that. In Cloud Function, you are going to, to save and read uh, files, uh, temporary, temporary files, and they are stored in memory. They are not stored on the disk. They are stored in memory. And you should not forget to clean up, to delete them when you're at the end of your Cloud Function. Because if you don't, they will 
uh, stay in the in the cloud function in the instance memory and it will pile up up to up to a crash okay and also another classical function is to uh, to directly use the await key keyword within a for each loop it doesn't work because for for each waits uh, for a callback function while await return a promise returns a promise so it doesn't work the way to 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 deal with that is to use promise all so exactly like the example I shown, you uh, you uh, declare an array, and in your for uh, in your for each loop, you populate the array, and after that, you call promise all. Okay. I have a demo app, but I think we don't have the time. So uh, it's a it's a it's an application that um, translate uh, an image. That is uploaded. Okay, you can upload an image. I can give a, a very, very, very fast uh, demo. Okay, so it's something that you can use with your uh, with your um, uh, mobile phone. Okay, and uh, you take a picture. So here I'm on, on on a laptop. So I will select an image, an image containing some text. Okay, and it will trigger a set of cloud functions, and it will uh, call the Google Translate API. Get back the uh, the English uh, translation, and we'll display it in the uh, in the application at the bottom. So there is a, a bit of of uh, of call start, but you see uh, the app has identified that the original language was Italian and gives me back the the English uh, uh, version. I draw your attention on the fact that this application is quite interesting to see how you can orchestrate different cloud functions, different services. In such a way to to uh, to build such an app, and uh, and uh, you will be surprised because actually the code to write such an application is uh, mo not more than twenty five lines. Okay, so you will find in the slide uh, the um, an article on Medium on Medium which explain exactly how uh, how it works with uh, with uh, okay, some demo of uh, of the screen and also uh, really a detailed explanation on how all those different services. File store, cloud storage, cloud function, cloud vision API, and the Firebase extension are orchestrated all together to give this result. So, I, if you are interested, I think it's a very good uh, uh, example. And, uh, yeah. uh, and that's it. There is a slide with some more general links, okay, more use case, the official cloud function library, which is on GitHub. It's a really a, a must read. The official video series, a must watch. Uh, and some uh, a link to some tips and tricks. And uh, with that, I would like to, to thank you all for having listened to me. I hope it was interesting. Uh, let's connect on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Medium. I will be happy to connect to, with all of you. And uh, let's open the, the floor for Q&A. Um, thank you very much for the uh, wonderful uh, talk, Renat. Um, while we are waiting for uh, some questions from uh, our audience, uh, some of our members have uh, shown interest. Uh, if uh, I, I, if you will be willing to share your slides uh, on Twitter or something, um, uh, they'll really appreciate it. They, they, I think they want to uh, go through the slides. Um, uh, can I ask uh, our audience members uh, in chat to start uh, posting some questions uh, for Renat? Um, there is a question from Casey. Um, is there a way to keep up at least one instance running at all times as uh, sometimes one API call can take to 10 seconds to kick up um, the instance? Um, causing a bad experience for for users. So if your API call, uh, when I, okay. So here it's about the call start. Okay, that I was I was mentioning. Uh, like I said, uh, Firebase is actively working on 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 that, and there will be some uh, good news I think in the next month. I cannot uh, disclose too many details, but the idea is indeed to have the possibility, if I had correctly understood. To, to 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 have something like that to keep up uh, one instance running. So let's see what what's going to happen. But uh, they are they are very aware of of of, of that of this uh, not this problem, but of, of of the fact that we could improve this uh, this point. So 
there will be some some good news i i think in the next months okay so here it's really the problem of of call start okay so where uh one api call can take up to 10 seconds because the 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 what what's happening is that the the, the google cloud platform has to take the container containing the the cloud function and has to deploy it in a new instance okay and then uh, all the, the libraries used in your cloud function have have to be loaded and only then it can start okay so this is a, the, the the call start phenomenon is known and again but it's difficult in a serverless environment to to really reduce that to to zero so some good news to come Uh, another question from uh, Casey: Will there ever be an African zone? The latency is really bad for South African users. Um, I don't know. I don't comment know. Comment that. I don't know. Sorry, I don't have the answer, and I do understand. Uh, maybe, uh, yeah, contact the Fibers support and uh, push on any communication channel that you that you can. Uh, but probably in the future it will come. But I have no. No information around that. Sorry. Thank you, Tash. Uh, just uh, comments. Um, really great talk, Renat. Uh, thank you. Thank uh, you. Um, do we still have some questions uh, from the audience? <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, uh, Renard. Um, I think um, uh, that uh, that's all uh, from our audience in terms of questions.